valiant in battle turn to flight the armies of the alien. Women received their dead raised to life again. Others were what? Tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings. Yes, and of chains and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to gather together and to sit, as it were, at your feet and ask you, O oh God, to guide us and direct us into wondrous things from your word, from your law. Lord, as we take the opportunity to look at these six individuals, as we take the opportunity to look at the ten things said about their walk of faith, Lord, we pray and ask that you would change us. Lord, as we've just sung in, in so many different lines in, in these songs that we've just sung, Lord, our hope, our faith needs to be in you and in your truth and in your word. And so, Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity to study this passage of Scripture together and Lord, we pray and ask that your spirit would guide us into its truth and change our hearts. Lord, for that to happen, you have got to bring us to the end of ourselves so that our faith is not in us, so that our faith is not in circumstances working out the way we think, but that our faith is in you our unchanging God who sees and knows all things. And in your promises being fulfilled no matter the enemy, no matter the weakness, no matter the circumstance, Lord, even in the outcome. Lord, we pray that you would build us up in the most holy faith. And Lord, bring us to the end of ourselves that we would worship and serve you. And may you be glorified, we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. The writer of Hebrews is winding down his list of heroes of the faith in Hebrews chapter 11. He will have taken us from Abel all the way to the prophets. In other words, from Genesis to Malachi and even into the very beginning of the New Testament. And he has just gone right through the Old Testament, given us illustrations of what? Faith. Faith. Illustration after illustration, example after example. And with each one of these persons mentioned in Hebrews 11, he has said very little. Just short blurbs that to the original audience of Hebrews who understood and knew the Old Testament better than most, they would, have, they would have thought back through what was told of Abel and Enoch and Moses and Abraham. And, but he said very little about them. Now he's even going to say less. Now he's just going to give us six names. And that's it. And then he's going to give us in verses 33 to 35 10 things that we might call positive that were the result of their faith. 
And then from verse 35 through the end of the chapter, he's going to give us a whole bunch of what we're tempted to call negative things that happened as a result of their faith. But you know what? Even those really aren't negative because he says the world's not worthy of these who laid their life down by faith. So really, it's not right to say we're looking at the positive results today and we're going to look at the negative results starting in the future. We're going to look at the positive results now and we're going to look at the even better results in the future. But we don't have time to look at all of them at one fell swoop. And so we're going to look today in verses 32 to 35 at six persons... Six individuals and one group, the prophets. And then we're going to look at the ten results, the, the ten results that the writer of Hebrews mentions. But I want you to notice he's mentioning these six people to provide rich truth and lessons regarding genuine faith. I want to remind you of the reason the writer of Hebrews is doing this. He's wanting the Hebrews to see and hear and understand what genuine faith looks like. Why? Because he is convinced that many of the people sitting there reading this letter are just religious and not believers. Don't forget that. He is wanting to make sure that those who are sitting there among the Hebrews who are good Hebrews, good keepers of the law, but who have never committed to faith in Christ, understand that their life does not look like those who had faith. And he's wanting to encourage those who do have faith to say, look at what happened to them and look at how God used it and look at how God brought them through. And so we come to a text where the writer of Hebrews brings us to six more, um, six more Ill, Ill, uh, examples. Um, and, and he says, and look at verse 32, Hebrews eleven thirty-two. 32. He says, and what more shall I say? You know, he has already gone through all these examples. And he comes to this place and, and he says, What more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Bar Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets. One author defined or, or it translated that phrase as, Why do I still speak? Why am I still speaking? He says, Because... There's so much that could be said. And we don't have time to say it all. And yet he writes six more names. And he gives characteristic after characteristic after characteristic of genuine faith. Why? Because he doesn't want a religious person going to hell. Because they never came to faith. Folks, this is probably one of the most important truths in our day and age. Because our churches are full of religious people. In our men's Bible study recently, we just did a study or began to do a study of the fact that good religious people need to repent and receive Jesus. You look at Acts 8, 9, and 10, you see three people who were good and religious but who had never repented and received Christ till somebody brought the gospel to them and they believed. And, by the way, they were baptized. All three of them. Why? Because when you believe, you... When you believe, you... We haven't done such a good job here, have we? When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, what does he want us to do? Maybe we need to change our sermon. 
When we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to be... Starts with B, folks. Be baptized. Be baptized. Right? Isn't that true? But they were good religious people. But they still needed to believe and follow the Lord in baptism. And so the writer of Hebrews comes today to six more men, six more persons, individuals, listed here as examples of faith. Um, then he goes on in verses 33 to 35 to give us 10 characteristics. So, by the way, there's an outline in your bulletin that will hopefully help you to follow me. And today we want to look at six individuals. Who does he mention? We want to look at 10 characteristics of their faith. What did they do? And as we go through this, we want to be looking at what do we learn about genuine faith. All right? So look at verse 32. The first one he mentions, six examples of faith, six individuals. The first one he mentions is Gideon. And by the way, when he mentioned these names to the original audience of Hebrews, they probably had a mind full of truth. How many of us know anything about Barak? How many of us know anything about Jephthah? Even fewer. Yeah. How many of us know stuff about David? You know, Samuel. And he picks six individuals. By the way, they're not in chronological order, as you will see on your outline. Um, they're not seemingly in any particular order, although that's debatable. And he doesn't even tell us specifically anything about them, except for the list of 10 things that follow. But the list of 10 things that follow only makes sense if we understand a little bit about each one. And so briefly, we want to just touch on each one here. Number one, Gideon. His account is found in Judges 6, 7, and 8. If you read Judges 6, 7, and 8, you will read about the story, the account, not story, the account the historical account of Gideon, who God used by faith to defeat the Midianites. If you remember, the Midianites, Scripture says, were numerous as locusts. They were numerous as locusts, and they had camels without number. They would have been a formidable enemy. To top that off, Gideon at one point had 32,000 men, and God said, Gideon, 32,000 is too many. So I want you to tell those that are fearful to go home and, what, 20,000 left? 22,000 left, something like that. And then he said, there's still too many. 10,000 is too many, so take them down to the stream and let them drink. And the ones that drink a certain way, and, and folks, I remember thinking, okay, they were the ones that drank on their knees, looking around, they were real vigilant. I don't think that's it at all. I don't think that's it at all because God's whole point was this is not about you and them. God whittled it down to 300 men. And he said, get in, you got your army. Oh, and by the way, no swords, no spears. I want you each to have a trumpet, a pitcher, and a torch. And Gideon, I want you to go and I'm going to give the Midianites into your hands. That's Gideon. And by the way, he did that. And the word of God tells us the reason they didn't need spears and swords was because the Lord set every man's sword against his companion in the Midianite army. They destroyed themselves. They destroyed themselves. Folks, question. Does God need you and I's strength and wisdom to do his will? No, as a matter of fact, if I go into the battle with my strength and my wisdom, I'm probably going to fall flat on my face. That's Gideon. That's Gideon. It's not about numbers. It's not about might. It's about the Lord. It's not about me. It's about him. That's faith. 
Could we just stop right there and go home? Will we take the time to meditate and think about and, 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 and chew on that and allow it to become part of our spiritual muscle and being and go in the strength of the Lord? That's Gideon. Folks, every one of these could be a sermon in and of itself. I, I, I got to be careful and keep moving. Amen? Barak. Barak is in Judges 4 and 5. Why did he jump around? I have no idea. Gideon's in Judges 6, 7, and 8. Barak's account is in Judges 4 and 5. Barak is he whom God used by faith to defeat the armies of Jabin, king of Canaan, who was led by Sisera, the commander of Jabin's armies. Barak had 10,000 men just from two tribes of Israel, from Naphtali and Zebulon, and he went against Jabin's army, which scripture says was a multitude that had 900 chariots of iron. That's like saying they had 900 Apache helicopters or tanks or whatever. And yet God promised Barak in chapter Judges 4 verse 15, it says that the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And verse 16 of Judges 4 says, Not a man was left. Not a man was left. Do you know how Sisera died? Not at Barak's hands, but at the hands of a woman. The hands of a woman who saw him and invited him in and covered him up in her tent, and she went with him with a tent peg and a hammer and pounded it through his temple. That was a woman who stood for the truth of God and Israel and was used. Barak didn't even get the glory of killing Sisera. And yet Barak is listed here as an example of faith and, and folks, what's, what's the lesson there? God will accomplish all that he said. Not a man escaped. But you won't get the glory. And if you do, we've missed the whole point. We've missed the whole point. If Barak didn't walk around saying, wow, look what God did, and walked around saying, look what I did, he would have been insane to not see that it was of God and that everything God says is done. That's Barak. And then there's Samson, Judges 14 to 16. Samson was he whom God used by faith to, to do in, uh, several things. And you know, if I was going to talk about somebody of faith, I would not have picked Samson, would you? Wow! And yet God lists him in his hall of faith. And again, I'm going to give you a homework assignment for next week. And it's listed right at the top of your outline. I want to encourage every one of us this week to read Judges chapters 4 through whatever it is, 16, something like that, and 1 Samuel. And I want you to list every lesson you learn in the lives of these men about faith. I want to challenge you to do that. Because it is so rich. And Samson's one of them. Samson's one of them. He's one that God used to do several things. By the Spirit, he tore a lion in pieces with his bare hands. I would like to have seen that. You know, I, I'm just a stupid outdoorsman enough to say, I, yeah, I'd, I'd like to have seen that. You know, if, if Nature Channel had that on, I would probably watch it. With his bare hands. By the Spirit, he did it, Scripture says. In chapter 14, 5 to 6. By the Spirit, he killed 30 men in Ashkelon. Chapter 14, verse 19. By the Spirit, he killed 1,000 men with the jawbone of a, of a donkey. In uh, Ramah Leah, 
in chapter 15, 14 to 17. By the Spirit, he killed 3,000 lords of the Philistines and their wives in the temple of Dagon in Gaza. And my friend, I want you to know that Scripture says he did every one of those by the Spirit. You know, every cartoon I've seen of Samson is this hulk of a man. Don't forget that when his hair was shaved because of his Nazarite vow, he was a weakling. His strength was not in his brawn. His strength was not in his build. He was a wimp when it came to women. Amen? First it was the harlot. Or, or was there two harlots involved? And then there was Delilah. Are you kidding me? Three times she says, tell me your, your strength. He tells her and she lies. Puts the Philistines against him and he did it again and he did it again. And finally he just spews it all and tells her, her heart, his heart. So what was important about Samson? His faith to believe God and get back up and keep serving God. We want to make it about us. Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Folks, Samson. And, and he did this by faith. Look at chap, uh, Judges 14.4. We're, we're going to look at a couple of these just quickly. Judges 14.4. I want you to know that what Samson did, he did by faith in God. In Judges chapter 14 and verse 4, uh, Samson had, had gone down to the Philistines and he wanted a woman of the Philistines and his parents are saying, no, what are you doing? And in chapter 14, verse 4, it says, uh, and I'm in Joshua, that doesn't help me. Um, but his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. You know that God we've been talking about every week who sees and knows all things? He said, I want Samson right here because I want to move against the Philistines because of what they're doing to my people. And don't miss the fact that Samson did what he did by faith in God who was moving in and through him. Is that true of you and I? Are we doing what we're doing because of what God is moving to do? Or are we doing what we're doing because of our own will, our own way, our own wisdom, our own strength? Samson is an example of faith. Jephthah. Judges 11 to 12. Jephthah is he whom God used to defeat the Ammonites with what Scripture says was a great slaughter. Who was Jephthah? Jephthah was an ostracized son of a harlot who his stepbrothers cast out of the family and said, you don't get any inheritance with us. And then he went out and he ran with a worthless band of rebels. That's Jephthah. And he became one of the greatest leaders in Israel. You, 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 you mean God could use somebody like that? Are we any better? Or is there no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? Folks, I don't care who you are today. 
I don't care what's true of your history. You turn to the Lord and follow the Lord and he can use you. And he'll do it in such a way that he gets all the glory. Not you, not me. As a matter of fact, we start to take the glory and the carpet starts to get ripped out from under and we fall. Why? Because it's not about us. It's about him. It's about him. And so Jephthah became a leader, a ruler in Gilead, and, and by the Spirit he defeated the Ammonites in their 20 cities. He also defeated 42,000 Ephraimites in Judges chapter 12, verses 5 to 6. My friend, it matters not who you are. It matters whether you trust God. And obey God and follow God. Do we believe that? Do we live in light of that? Then, of course, there's David. And if you turn to 1 Samuel, you read the account of David through chapter 16, I think it is. 1 Samuel and David is he who God used by faith to do many things. And you know his exploits. You know that he killed Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. He defeated many enemies of Israel. 1 Samuel 18, the women sang, Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his ten thousands. To which Saul got very angry. He faithfully trusted the Lord and served Saul, the Lord's anointed even when he was trying to kill him. Why did he do that? By faith. He's the Lord's anointed. I will not raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. Why? Because he was principle driven. He was not emotionally driven. He was not selfishly driven. He trusted God in his word and his purpose, and his timing. And so he faithfully served Israel, even when many in Israel hated him. He patiently waited God's fulfillment of his anointing. He was anointed king in 1 Samuel 16. He didn't become king until 2 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 4. And all that time he continued to honor God's anointed. Why did he do that? Because of faith. And God and God's timing and God's will and God's way and not his. Folks, that's faith. That's faith. And throughout that time, folks, he overcame the opposition of Saul. He overcame the opposition of nations. He overcame battle after battle after battle. He overcame his personal failures. He overcame family turmoil. Why? Because he continued through it to be a man who was pursuing God's heart. Is that us? This last week is God's heart what we pursued. Or did we just pursue our vengeance, our our reputation, our desires, our... That's not faith. Right? David. He pursued God's heart all of his days. Trusted by faith in God. Not in self, not in self-accomplishments. 
you get a chance, I would encourage you to get online and, and Google or find Doc, uh, Kevin DeYoung's uh, graduation address at Geneva College that just took place about four days ago. In it, he talks about the fact that you should not be true to yourself. You should not follow your heart and your dreams. And you should not believe in yourself. You should be true to God. You should follow God and His Word. You should believe in Christ, not yourself. Folks, we live in a crazy world where even in Christendom, we worship self rather than God. And it's permeating the church and the preaching and the teaching of the evangelical church today. Used to be that was the liberals. Used to be that was the, the ones that we would never listen to. Now you hear it all over the internet today from evangelical supposedly conservative pastors and churches. And it's unbiblical. Folks, we need genuine faith in God and His Word. Amen? Folks, I, I can't scream that loud enough. It is permeating much of the preaching and teaching that some of us are listening to. You say, Jeff, how do you know that? Because I've talked to you. And I've heard some of the stuff that we're listening to and we're reading and we're believing and we're following and we're regurgitating. And it's not of faith. And whatever is not of faith is sin. And folks, should that surprise us? Isn't that exactly what the Word of God says is going to happen in the last days? Men will be lovers of themselves, proud, boasters, disobedient, not wanting authority. And folks, it's, 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 it's damning, it's dangerous. No wonder the writer of Hebrews continued to plead. Continued to plead. Then there's Samuel. Man, I'm so glad for the study of Samuel. Samuel is an incredible example of faith. He was anointed prophet in 1 Samuel 3.20 and he was anointed judge in 1 Samuel 7. And he faithfully served proclaiming God's word in unpopular times. Did you hear that? Samuel continued to faithfully proclaim God's truth in unpopular, dangerous times. We need this. We need this faith. He faithfully served proclaiming God's word. Samuel served the Lord as a child wearing a linen ephod. 1 Samuel 2.18. He's the one that said in chapter 3.10, Speak, Lord, for thy servant hears. Is that us? Speak, Lord, whatever you want. Is that us? And if not, why not? Samuel's the one who in 1 Samuel 3.19 the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. Now, again, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. Question, can God do that with you and I today? There's only one way. And that's if you and I proclaim this right here. Samuel has nothing up on you and I today. But you know why our words fall on the ground? It's because they come from here or here instead of here. But Samuel was known and he was feared in Israel. 
As a matter of fact, he was reverenced in Israel because people who wanted to hear from God went to Samuel. I just heard from one of our own people this week who walked into work one day and somebody he didn't even really know who has just gone through difficult times came to him and said, you're the one I want to talk to. And he's like, really? He said, yeah, because you're religious and I need some answers. Folks, are we known for those who believe in and follow and trust in and proclaim the truth of God to the point where others would say, I want to know what you think about this. Not what you think. What does your God say? Amen? That was Samuel. Samuel. And it says that all Israel knew that Samuel had been established a prophet in Israel. There was no doubt he's God's man here. And in chapters 4 through 5, he led Israel through the time of the ark being captured and the glory departing. Now imagine that. Samuel, I want you to be my servant and I want you to lead in Israel during the days when my glory is going to depart because they turn their back on me. Well, Lord, I'd really rather serve another time. Folks, God has raised us up for such a time as this. That's Samuel. Wow. He led Israel through the time of repentance and restoration. And you know what he said to them during those days? He said this. He said, if you will return and put away your foreign gods and serve the Lord, he'll help you. Do we know anybody that needs to hear that today? Do we need to hear that today? That's faith. You say, well, Samuel, you're going to mess around and make a bunch of enemies. No, he's not trying to make enemies. He's just trying to truly love and help people and honor God. And he, and he spoke the truth. And in chapter 7, 7 to 13, he even led Israel through the defeat of the Philistines. He wasn't a military leader. And yet, following the Lord, he led the people and they defeated the Philistines. And I can't imagine that Samuel didn't get to the end of that and go, what just happened? How, how, wow, Lord. That, that was like cool, but man, I, I don't know how that happened, but you... Folks, God wants to work in and through you and I, every one of us. But He cannot and He will not until by faith we yield to Him and speak His truth and live His truth in a lost and a dying world. And in 1 Samuel 7.15, Folks, older folks, it says Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. Don't quit. Don't retire. Serve the Lord all the days of your life. When I said don't retire, I meant don't retire from serving the Lord. Your job, career, thing changes. Amen. Praise the Lord and use it for His glory. Amen. But serve the Lord all the days of your life. Not only that, but Samuel served during the days of Saul. Samuel served during the days of Saul. Do you remember that? Samuel's the one that when Israel decided they wanted a king, he said, I don't think that's a good idea. But they said, yeah, we want a king. And he went to the Lord and said, Lord, they want a king, but this isn't a good idea. And the Lord said, Samuel, go ahead. Go ahead. 
And so Samuel is the one that said to Israel, you have rejected God and you have called for a king instead. You have rejected God and you have called for a king instead. And again, all Israel feared God and Samuel. And Samuel is the one that said to them over and over, do not turn from following the Lord. Do not turn from following the Lord. And then he confronted Saul on two occasions. One, when he offered the, the sacrifice, and, and Samuel stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Saul and said, you have done foolishly in your false worship. You have done foolishly. Do you know anybody that's worshiping falsely? Inappropriately, not in spirit and in truth? Do you understand that if they continue to worship falsely, they're going to wind up as a religious person in hell? Have you told them? Samuel's the one that went to Saul after the battle with the Amalekites when Saul said, look what I did. And Samuel came along and said, you did not wipe them out. Oh, but I did. Well, then what means the bleeding of these sheep? And, and Saul sputtered and spit and tried to walk and talk himself out of it. And Samuel said, no, here's what God's word said. And here's what you did. Samuel's also the one that stood before Saul and said, I will not return with you. You rejected the Lord. Now he has rejected you from being king. And Samuel's the one that hacked Agag to pieces. He's also the one that anointed David king, even though he knew that if Saul heard about it, he was fearful he'd kill him. Folks, that's faith. That's faith. Just trusting God, trusting His Word, and obeying it. Rather than trusting ourself, rather than relying on our circumstances, our wisdom, our strength, our resources, you know, that's the kind of stuff that, man, I, Lord's calling me to the mission field, but, you know, I, I just don't know if I can afford it. Or I just don't know if I can do it. Or, or I know I should witness to that coworker, but, man, I'm scared to. We're scared to witness. Did you see what these people did? And what was the result? Ten things. And I don't know how many of these we'll get through. Maybe we'll only get through a few this week and the rest next. But look at the ten results. He also mentions the prophets, but that's huge. That's you know, the rest of the Old Testament. What were the ten results of faith? These are those who through faith did these things. Through faith. In other words, faith was the means... Trusting in God and His Word was the means. As opposed to trusting in themselves. As opposed to trusting in their own merit. Did Samson deserve to have God do what he did through him? Did David deserve to have God do what he did through him? Folks, I'm fearful that's where many of us live. Is, is we live as though God working in and through us is dependent upon us earning and deserving it. That's not grace and that's not faith. That's works. And that takes the glory away from God for His great grace and mercy. Now, should we live in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. 
But where sin abounds, Samson, Jephthah, David, grace does much more abound. But it takes faith to trust that. Right? Are you with me today? Did I upset you earlier or what? Are you with me? Look, look at these. Huh. Wow. By faith in God and who He is. They believed that God was real, that He was a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. They subdued kingdoms. They subdued kingdoms. In other words, mighty kingdoms were overcome and brought into subjection by faith. By faith. Egypt at the Red Sea. Man, those Israelites, they really just trusted God and God did all the work. Right? They subdued kingdoms, the Midianites, the Canaanites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, and others that we just saw. Kingdoms who outnumbered them and outgunned them. Now, they didn't have guns back then, but they did have chariots, and they did have lots of soldiers, and they were outnumbered and they were outgunned. Did that matter? Did, did numbers matter? Did horses and chariots matter? What is it we worry about that doesn't matter? Man, if only the politicians. Man, if only my 401k. Man, if only... Folks, that's not faith. And we walk by faith, not by sight. Or if we're honest with ourselves in the Lord, would we have to bow before Him and say, Lord, forgive me, I've been walking by sight. And get on our knees before God and say, God, change me. From now on, I want to trust you and go. Folks, that's faith. And that is sitting before every last one of us every moment of every day. What will we do? They subdued kingdoms. It matters not who our enemy is. It matters not who our enemy is. Do we believe that? I mean, these, Jericho, shut in, formidably locked up, Egypt, between a rock and a hard place. What am I worried about with this God? Look at Romans chapter 8 with me, please. Look at Romans chapter 8 with me. I, I see we're not going to get very far through this, so relax. Give me a moment. We'll wrap this up and we'll pick it up next week. Romans chapter 8. There's nothing worse than standing in the pulpit trying to find a, a passage and you, can't, you keep turning the wrong way. Romans 8, and look at verse 37. And back up to verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword? Do it. Any of us dealing with that? Or, or do our issues probably pale compared? And our issues are real, and they hurt, and they're hard, right? But the same faith needs to deliver me. Verse 36, and as it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. See, the problem is we don't like that verse. Because why is God bringing those difficult times? Because we've got to die daily to me and live to Christ. That's what God is trying to do in your life and mine through those difficult times. And by faith, we need to yield. 
Why? Verse 37, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Folks, it does not matter what is in front of us. By faith, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen? Folks, there's nine other characteristics here. The Lord willing, we'll pick up in a, in, in a week and look at. Because by faith, we can have the same victories that these people who have gone before us had. That's why in chapter 12, he's about to say, seeing we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the sin, the weight and the sin that so easily besets, and let us run with endurance. Folks, only by faith will we run with that endurance. Father, help us, I pray, in these moments. First of all, Lord, not to just get up and walk away and forget about your word. Not what I've said, not, not, not my thoughts. But God, the truth of the examples of faith that have been set before us. And Father, I pray that you would work in our hearts to understand that these examples of faith are not idealism. They're not far-reaching, unreachable goals. They are simple sinners who trusted you and saw you do everything you said you would do in their lives. And Lord, sometimes you delivered them out of the trial. Sometimes you took them through the trial. And Lord, sometimes you took them home to be with you. But through it all, you worked all things together for good to those that love you, to those who are called according to your purpose. And they were made more and more like you. Father, teach us what true faith is and cause us to follow hard after you by faith. Because, Lord, we need the endurance. We need the joy and peace that comes through believing. We need the blessed hope that no matter what comes, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what the weaknesses are, Lord, we have absolute assurance of victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Guide us to that end, we pray. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. My friend, if there's a need on your heart, let us talk to you before you leave here today.